Okay, the rate of new people seems to have slowed to something reasonable. So uh, I will uh, start. Um, and so it's my pleasure to introduce Glenn Whitney. Uh, he has played many roles, including being the founder of the Museum of Mathematics in New York. But recently he's been doing a lot of very innovative and creative uh, mathematical constructions with, with different units and has taken on the challenge to do one of those with us all not in the same place. So I'm very excited to see what um, we're going to be making with these interesting pieces. Um, I also want to uh, take this opportunity to, to thank Glenn. Um, there was a, a quite a big group of us who, who were organizing this um, workshop, but uh, we didn't really have any leader and he has he really stepped up as the person who kept us all on track and uh, made sure that everything got done um, and so thank you so much for that Glenn uh, and with that said I will pass you over and uh, I will be monitoring chat and so on um, so uh, if you have comments or thoughts do put them in there and I will communicate those to them but thank you and I'll pass you over. All right, well, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, I'm just happy to be a part of help bringing this uh, community together. And uh, I wanted to start with uh, sort of the setting and context and like why it, I think it's worth doing this and so on. Uh, so, uh, and again, you can see this, here's the URL modular not origami just after the main website. And I will go full screen so we can see, oh, I need to share. You can't see a thing yet, sorry. Uh, just a second. Um, uh, where is that? Okay. Um, share screen. Okay. There. Now I think you can see it. Um, and uh, yeah, just put modular dash not dash origami after the main website and you will uh, find this. And um, uh, here we go. Uh, so there are lots of different paths that come into mathematics. Many of us here have come in through traditional academic training and that's one good way. But many of us here have sort of arrived at an interest in mathematics through other routes. And I'm always excited and interested uh, to see those routes that um, arise uh, kind of organically from some other pursuit that doesn't perhaps initially seem to have anything to do with mathematics. And I've just shown some, uh, you know, example pictures from a couple of those things here. These are all kind of things that you can find out there uh, in the world uh, or on the web. Um, that clearly have some mathematical structure or content or, or where mathematics can be brought to bear. But again, where, where the original pursuit uh, wasn't consciously about mathematics. Um, and of course, we saw another wonderful example of this in Vernel Noel, Noel's uh, excellent presentation yesterday. So, and there's many more I could put up here. Uh, I obviously can't you know, do complete justice to this. But one of the reasons it excites me is because when I see things like this, I think, aha, this is an avenue that I could try to use to bring new people into mathematics and get them excited and, and at least to understand what mathematics has to offer, because maybe going straight in the front door of mathematics might not grab their attention, but starting with something that even if a person's not already into beating or not already into dominoes or whatever it might be, uh, they, you know, that might be more engaging to begin with. And then I can say, aha, and look, it's really, it's math that drove this. So, you know, you can imagine my delight when I see pictures like this. I mean, here's a whole smorgasbord uh, of, um, of, you know, mathematical objects. Again, that came out of this pursuit of, uh, of origami, a particular sort of branch of origami called modular origami. Uh, and again, they're just out there and the people who discover them and, and create them and produce them aren't necessarily coming from a consciously mathematical background. And most people have fiddled with origami at some point in their lives. They, maybe they made a crane or 
uh, at least a, what we used to call a cootie catcher at some point. So this is not a foreign notion. They know that makes interesting things. So it's a really uh, accessible way to start to get people uh, at least comfortable with the notion that mathematics maybe have something, has something to offer them and can help provide beauty and, and uh, enrich their lives. So this is all good. And in particular, when I saw this piece, um, which you can find on you know, Pinterest or uh, Flickr or so on, uh, this is a design uh, by uh, Roberto Gretter and this actual folding of this particular into piece was by a person named Michel Picula. When I saw this, you know, I really felt that this was something to aspire to because there's so much, first of all, I think it's beautiful, but second of all, there's so much going on here mathematically. Uh, if you count, you will discover that there are exactly the same number of uh, pentagonal uh, openings as there are heptagonal openings. And of course, those of you who have the, the requisite topological background know that's absolutely not an ac accident. No matter what torus we make uh, from these units that can only make pentagons, hexagons, and heptagons, uh, that they will always have to be equal uh, if, it's a, if it's a torus shape. And uh, that really is a nice intro to some, some fairly deep parts of mathematics. So, so there's so much going on here. And it's a nice big uh, construction. This one has 555 of the individual uh, units. Uh, and so I thought, oh, this is something meaty. If I ever get a nice big group together, uh, I can just have them fold these up and, and we'll just assemble them together and you know, create this beautiful structure uh, together. So, you know, some time passed and I got a call from a, a, a high school in Manhattan. They wanted me to come and do a double period session with uh, two math classes. So I'd have about 60 high school students together. And I thought, you know, 555 over 60, that's less than 10 a piece. Hey, have them make a dozen each just to have some extras and a double class period. You know, I timed how long it took me to fold one of these is like, no problem, this will be a piece of cake. Um, for those of you who have been involved in some of my events, you know that sometimes I veer toward the slightly ambitious. And so here's what ensued. Uh, and unfortunately, pictures fail me here because I, I in, the, in the midst of this utter chaos, I, I failed to record it photographically. Some people were just sort of dropping their finished pieces on the floor. Uh, it took a little longer than I had anticipated to get the folding down with the with these students. Um, and by the end of our double class period, uh, we had piles of crumpled paper, files of folded paper, and we had maybe about a seventh of a torus uh, that had actually been, you know, connected together. So fortunately, there is a there is a good save here. Uh, a dedicated subgroup, the sort of math club of the high school, sort of swept up all the pieces and then devoted their lunch times for the next roughly three weeks uh, and completed, well, this is actually six sevenths of the original, originally planned unit, but it was still enough to, uh, to fit around into a torus. And um, uh, they did eventually, you know, finish off the object, but, uh, Nevertheless, uh, that was six years ago, and I have not, between then and now, uh, done an event um, with these units. So we'll see if I can sort of break the, the uh, um, omen of, of the last time I used this type of unit for a, a construction. Uh, so there's an, obviously an obstacle here uh, that the, 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 the interesting part for us was how do these units link together and how, uh, what you could construct from them and to see that construction come together and then to start to be able to make some interesting mathematical observations about it. So I needed a way to overcome that obstacle of this initial folding step and getting these 555 pieces together. And, uh, I, but I didn't quite know how to, um, you know, how to, how to get over that hurdle. So it took another piece of chaos uh, to help me over the hurdle. This is a picture of um, a sort of 
it's off in the corner on the lower level of the Museum of Mathematics in New York City. Um, and you may not have noticed this little bit. It's, it's, all, it's usually cordoned off. But anyhow, that's a laser cutter. And it's next to this exhibit uh, on, on the right, which is called Tile Factory. And it's there because in Tile Factory, there's sort of a free form um, drawing program that'll let you make a tessellation based on you know, uh, one of the, uh, it gives you a few of different um, wallpaper groups that you can choose from. And then you can sort of make a free tiling that will have that wallpaper group of symmetries. And then the idea is that you could, once you've created a tiling, you could actually have the immediate satisfaction of having your tiles cut out of some material and then you can play with them and fit them together. So this is all good. And, and um, when there's somebody there, we, we couldn't make it self-serve. Somebody has to actually run the machine. And uh, anyhow, one day in the middle of a busy crowded day at the museum, the laser cutter literally caught on fire. There were you know, flames coming out of the top of the machine. Uh, and so I said to the folks that, that run the floor, like, maybe we shouldn't actually use a laser cutter. Maybe there's some other technology that could, could be safer. Uh, and that's what got me interested in these ideas of automated cutting machines. Uh, so you, know, you put in a sheet of something and it's actually got a physical blade that is run by the computer and, and cuts pieces. And uh, although, as far as I know, there's still a laser cutter in the basement of, of the Museum of Mathematics, uh, that got me interested in what these machines have done. And fortunately, because they've become more mainstream, people use them for uh, crafting and, and they, become, they become popular in a mainstream way. Then there's been a sort of an arms race among the, the uh, consumer level cutting machine manufacturers They've now become quite sophisticated. And so here is what is hopefully the chaos reducer. This is the machine that cut um, all of the pieces that uh, you all have. And uh, hopefully it's gonna free us from a lot of the time and effort of uh, doing all that folding. So that means it's time to build. I'll stop the share. And uh, for a lot of the rest of the uh, presentation, um, you're going to see more, more my hands than uh, you'll see my face. Hopefully that will be uh, useful. Um, so I will switch to the hand cam. And uh, here you can see sort of a diagram. Um, and it, uh, actually, if I switch back to, uh, I'll, I'll share my screen real quick uh, one more time. Um, if you go to uh, the home page and then click on the modular origami, you'll see there's a list of polyhedra. We're going to make um, genus uh, zero polyhedra today, keep things simpler. Uh, no, no heptagons for us. So you can see a list of polyhedra that have only uh, uh, hexagons and pentagons. Those are, the, those are the things that our units will make. And uh, you should pick one of these as your target. They're arranged in increasing number of pieces required. So here's a straight up dodecahedron, requires 30 pieces, all the way to if you're truly ambitious, you've received just enough pieces to make a full soccer ball, truncated icosahedron at the bottom. So I'll let you pick your, your target. Um, and now stopping the share and going back to my printed diagram. Um, yeah, going back to my printed diagram, uh, I've just printed out a copy of the diagram and I've labeled it with the colors that I'm going to use. Um, I've chosen a relatively modest one. This is the uh, Triacus tetrahedron, uh, truncated Triacus tetrahedron. And um, uh, this will be my guide building. So if you've had a chance to do that, great. If you haven't, well, you can either try to do it on the fly or you could follow along and exactly replicate what I'm making. Uh, that's up, that'll be up to you. Uh, and I've, uh, I've punched out a bunch of my pieces as I had suggested you might want to do in that page, but understanding that some people's pieces arrived just today uh, and other people may not have had a chance or might not have noticed. 
we'll start with uh, punching out some pieces. So you should have sheets that look uh, roughly like this. And you can see the rectangular pieces in here. And the idea is they should pop out easily, but sometimes they don't pop out quite as easily as you might want them to. So um, there's two sides, the sort of, uh, if you will, convex side, where it's sort of the bumps are towards you, which is also the side where you can really feel the cuts with your fingertip much more than on the back where they're smooth. We'll call that the A side. And when you're looking at the A side, if you fold the little cuts away from you, so make mountain folds out of them, that really helps with the separation. And then you should be able to just pull apart and they should start to just come apart. And then the, the straightaways definitely come apart more easily. These little uh, divots can be a little harder, but they should separate fairly easily. If they don't, you may need to, to fold them back as well along those diagonals. And you might need to maybe put your fingernails on opposite sides of the sheet and push sort of perpendicularly to the sheet. And they should come apart. And uh, you should get a supply of these little rectangular pieces, like so. If a little tiny corner breaks off, it's, you know, it's not going to be it's not going to prevent your, your um, construction from coming together. OK, and so that would give us an individual piece like that. And so if the, the minimum of these you need to actually make a closed polyhedron is 30, if you're going to do the, the dodecahedron. Uh, I have 42 uh, prepared. Uh, you know, and I understand that, uh, so there may be timing differences here. Some people are are pulling pieces out. Um, and that's OK. Uh, so there's going to be a, a fairly wide range of finishing times. So um, I am hoping that we'll get a number of completed uh, units so I can get a nice little group photo. And uh, if we complete, let's see, uh, what's uh, 6 sevenths of 555, um, you know, some, something uh, in the high 400s. Um, so if, uh, you know, at least, um, say 15 of us, uh, completed dodecahedron or larger, this will set a new personal record for events that I've led in terms of number of units used. So there's a very modest goal. Uh, hopefully we can make it over that. And I'd love to get a group picture of, uh, some people's constructions, um, at the end in gallery view. So anyhow, this is a, a single, um, uh, punched out piece. And you can see there are some internal uh, slits that are important. So I want to do the same thing with those. I want to just fold them uh, away from me when I'm looking at the A side and uh, just open those up because I will need to be inserting uh, you know, the tabs in the slots, as they say. And uh, I'm going to just open these all up. Um, OK, that's good. And uh, I'll get these, these tabs in the corners here. I want to slip those at all. And you may notice that the tabs in the corners, uh, where they reattach back into the main material, there's a little sort of inward divot there. And you want to try your best to get that punched out uh, to the extent you can. Definitely, you want the tabs to narrow a little bit there. Because of course, it's that narrowing that keeps them uh, in the slots. Once you have it connected, you want to have some mechanical force keeping it into the slot. So uh, that's why it's important to try to get that divot separated. So there we go. And we've got both of these corners. And then in the middle, there's two additional tabs that are, that are made up out of the material of the unit. And so you want to uh, disconnect those as well so that they can, you know, sort of flap freely out like that. They are attached, uh, you know, along the base. So, so, so they're sort of only cut on three, three edges. So don't, don't rip them out too vigorously because they need to remain attached. And that'll be sort of an extra buckle that will add uh, to the sort of physical stability of our finished product. So there's a completely, you know, punched out and all the cuts separated uh, piece. And um, although 
uh, we're not going to really be doing origami, the unit still has a three-dimensional structure that's based on certain creases. And uh, so I've created crease lines for you to hopefully make this folding step uh, really rapid. So um, picking up another piece, the crease lines come in two different forms, and I'll explain why in a minute. Sometimes they look sort of like you ran your fingernail over the plastic, like this one does. Uh, and other times, uh, they look like sort of a dotted line. And that is because the tool that I showed you that I, that I cut these on had two heads. And I put a cutting tool in one and a creasing tool in the other. And it's the creasing tool that made these ones that look like a fingernail. But somewhere midway through the over 7,000 units that I cut, the second tool carriage simply up and died. So I don't want you to think that this uh, whole talk is a commercial for Silhouette Cameo Pro. You're getting the, the good and the bad. It did manage to cut all of these, but, uh, but the second tool died midway. So I had to quickly improvise and do this uh, dashed cut pattern to uh, create score lines for the remaining units. So you may have some of each. In fact, you likely have some of each. So anyhow, I'll just go over now what folding you need to do. Again, with the A side up, so it should be slightly curved away from you, or uh, you should be able to feel the, the, the rough edges of those openings. You want to uh, first make a mountain fold. So fold away from you so that the two ends of the piece exactly line up. So you're just, you're just folding in half, uh, well, the long way or with a short fold. And there should be a crease line there that will help you do that uh, very easily, like so. And the other thing uh, to notice about this, when you complete the crease, is that uh, on one end of the piece, there'll be a little divot just to the left of the crease. And at the, at the other side, there'll be a little divot just to the right of the crease. So this uh, central crease exactly splits the divot. So it doesn't go from the innermost point of the divot to the innermost point of the divot. It goes just between the two divots and folds the piece exactly in half so that the end matches up. So that's the first fold. All the other folds are in the opposite direction. And you can see that the crease lines, what they're going to be. You're going to make a diagonal fold here that brings the left edge along the, where you made the first fold like so. And again, you'll, this time, you'll see that the folds go right to the center of the divot. Um, and uh, that's sort of why the divots are there, is to kind of help you make that, that crease. And then you can flip it over and you fold the tab exactly that same way. So it makes a little kind of triangular pyramid here, just like that. And now you do exactly the same thing on the opposite side. You can just turn it over. And again, we're in the opposite direction of this top crease. We're bringing the left edge up to the top. And I'm just folding along that existing crease there. And then I can flip it over and do the same thing with this tab bringing it together like a tent. And that is a piece that's now ready to uh, put together with the other, with the other folks. Uh, this one I, did, I for, didn't, it, you can get, it's easier to, sorry, it's easier to divide these um, slits uh, when you have the piece flat, but on this red one, I forgot. So it is possible to open up the tabs and, and so on and the slits after you folded it. It is, as you can see, it's a bit, it's a bit trickier. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that with this one. Okay. Okay. 
So in the spirit of your learning from my mistakes, uh, do try to remember to separate your slits and tabs um, before, before folding. Okay, and finally, these buckles. The buckles are actually the hardest after you folded it because they're in such tight folds in the center. Okay. And also notice that in order to fit the sheets into your into your packs, you'll find that the center fold is already folded on on some of your pieces. Right when right from the get go. Okay, very good. So that piece is complete. And just to recap so that you can see the whole thing again, um, I will go ahead and uh, do the folding on, on this pink one as well. This one has the other style of creases with the, with the cut lines. Uh, so I've got the A side toward me. So it's curving away from me. I'll now fold away from me to make a mountain fold along that dotted uh, crease line. Um, and then I uh, fold the opposite direction, bring the left side up to the folded top. And again, it should find, the material will just naturally want to find that pre-scored crease, flip it over, do this tab. Here is this pre-scored crease, like so. And then uh, I can do the same thing on the other side, bring the left edge up to the top fold, finds the pre-scored crease, flip it over, bring the tab down, and I get another piece ready to, ready to construct. Okay, so, so that's how you Glenn, get the, yes. Um, I think people are asking to see one of the finished units a little bit. So uh, maybe if you can just hold and rotate that one to. Okay, to yes, very add. good. So it looks sort of like two upward pointing uh, pyramids uh, connected by this seam in the middle. So you know you've gotten all the folds in the correct direction when it looks like that. Uh, but there is a handedness and you, if you want them all to be the same handedness as me, that's why I was emphasizing the A side versus the B side. So you know you're the same handedness as the ones that I've got. If uh, when you look at it from above like this with the two pyramids pointing to you, towards you, if the tab on the left is you know pointing up or away from you, uh, that's the handedness that I've got. If you if you reversed all of the folds on every single piece, your construction would also work, but it would have the opposite handedness. But the key thing is that every individual one that you fold together has to have the same handedness. And if I rotate it around, here's what it looks like, you know, from the underside and, uh, and so on. So hopefully that makes it a little clearer. Should I go through uh, another one, uh, the folding from the top? Can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. So right now, none of the tabs should actually be inserted into anything or, or like That's right. We've we just gotten these okay. two pieces ready to link. Um, okay. And uh, I recommend that you have at least three completely ready to link before you link anything. Um, okay. I'm going to nice. start linking some things up in just a minute. Uh, but um, yeah, I do recommend you have at least three ready to go before you start. Uh, because in the final constructions, uh, as you uh, might gather from those skeleton diagrams of the polyhedra, it's always going to be three units coming together, always going to be three units coming together at a vertex. And my recommendation is in general, 
complete any vertex you come to. Any vertex you start to link up, uh, you know, go ahead and, and uh, link that up completely. OK. So um, I'm going to refer to my drawing diagram, and I'm going to make sure that I have three uh, ready. I have, I have a red and a pink ready. So I'll find a red-pink junction. And the third one in my diagram at a red-pink junction happens to be green. So I will um, go ahead and uh, do a green one. And so I'll make sure that I have gotten all of the tabs separated and all the slits opened up first. And you may find as you're uh, doing this that some pieces just some colors just come apart a little more easily than other colors. And that's for two reasons. Even though these are all nominally the same plastic material, not every brat. Oh, and incidentally, for those of you that are interested, uh, what this material is, is lighting gel for theatrical productions. That was the most easily available, comes in multiple, multiple colors, comes on rolls so I could run it through my machine in bulk. Uh, so that became the ideal material uh, for this particular build. Uh, but I could use any sheet material that comes you know, on, on rolls. Uh, and uh, anyhow, although they're nominally all the same plastic, maybe the different coloring agents affect the physical properties, so you get, you get differences. And then, of course, there's blade sharpness. I went through about five blades in the course of cutting all these pieces. And so my apologies, there's, there is some difference, you know, if you happen to have gotten ones that were toward the end before a blade was uh, changed out or just after the blade, uh, a new blade was put in. Okay, uh, so again, I'm going to fold this. I've got the A side toward me, so it's curving away from me. Uh, I'm going to make a mountain fold in the center to just fold the whole thing in half, like so. Uh, and then I take the left edge, bring it up to the top, and it will find that pre-score, flip it over to do this tab to come back toward me to finish off the pyramid. And now I can do the same thing on the other end. Fold here. And I can fold this down to finish this. And I've got my two pyramids side by side. And here's what the whole thing looks like. If anybody uh, is feeling um, maybe a little insecure about uh, whether theirs came out uh, sort of in, in a fashion that's going to allow them to uh, link together well, if you want to. Uh, you know, we can give you the camera and uh, you can hold yours up and we can verify or if you're, if people are feeling comfortable, that's great. So um, if we can get the mood of how people are feeling about whether their units are coming out uh, uh, sort of like, like the ones here you see on camera. Um, sorry, do the colors matter at all? Or are they all the same? Because I don't so think- So they are geome geometrically identical. The colors are for decoration. If you want to use a color scheme that brings out perhaps the symmetries of your polyhedron, or if you want to assign colors randomly, or there's not enough to make a monochrome unit. There's only 18 of each color. So you need to use at least two colors uh, depending on your polyhedron. But the, the color scheme is entirely up to you. OK, thank you. So I keep having the issue of like mine keep breaking. Is there like any good advice on to not how to not break them? So what kind of breakage are you are you getting? I'm. It's like mostly with the creases, um, like the the ones that are like inside. If you hold it up a little like, higher, it like breaks like this. So the tab is no longer a tab and is like a flap. Aha! Uh -huh. So it broke along the score line more. Or yeah. Less. 
So the mine are like, I've noticed especially the blue one is like more brittle uh -huh. and it's just breaking a lot. Okay. Well, uh, on, under the circumstances, I guess my advice would be if you aren't going to try to use all 90 pieces, switch, like switch swap blue for another color. If the physical, like I said, I don't have complete control over the physical property. So if the blue is breaking a lot, maybe just swap colors if the other ones aren't doing it. The main thing that's going to really help prevent the breaking, uh, if, again, if, I, if you can see here, is try to get that as well folded as I can before uh, I separate it. And also when you do separate it, the, the most effective way of separating is one fingernail to the left on top, the other fingernail to the right on the bottom and push perpendicular uh, to, the, to the, um, the cut there. The breaking is happening when you're, when you're popping out this tab, right? Not when you're doing the folding. Right, it's like when I'm, it's not the tabs, it's like the crease or like not the creases, but like the cuts in the center for like where oh, the tab goes inside. Like the slit right here? Yeah, the slits are breaking. Yeah, yeah, so fold it like as fully back along the slit as you can before you try to separate it and separate it by pushing opposite directions perpendicular to the plane of the plastic. Um, and then it usually will just only break in a small part of it and then you can just extend the cut to the end until you hit resistance. So hopefully that'll reduce the breakage for you. And my apologies again with the vagaries of the material. I have a question. How did you decide the color scheme for your personal? Uh, well, the pattern? particular one that I'm doing, this Triaca Cetrahedron, I wanted to highlight the fact that this originally did come from a tetrahedron. So I colored all of the pentagons that came from one face of the original tetrahedron, the same color. And I use a different color for each of the four faces. And then there are six places that correspond to edges of the original tetrahedron. And I made those the contrasting green color. So that's how I used the five colors for this scheme. So we should in the end, see a red face, an orange face, a pink face, and a magenta face. And then uh, you guys don't have green, but I, you guys got all my blue, so I switched green for blue. Uh, I'll, have, I'll have green uh, edges connecting those groups of pentagons. That's the thing I chose, but I could have taken you know, orbits under the symmetry group of the tetrahedron. Um, you know, I could have made it half one color, half the other color. I mean, there's, there's lots of possibilities. So in just a minute here, once I, once I get this one all separated and folded, uh, I'll show you how they link up. And um, then once you can make and link vertices, uh, you can more or less uh, just follow any of the polyhedron diagrams um, on the web page, Or of course, I'll, I'll uh, keep a running tally of, um, you know, how I'm linking things up. So if you want to follow this Triacus tetrahedron that I'm making, you're also welcome to do that.
Okay, so I've got a little bit of a supply of um, the folded units now. I'm going to go ahead and go over how they link up, uh, and uh, so you can you know watch you as you're as you're um, pulling them up, or or if you have some units, you can you can follow along and put together a vertex uh, as I do, um, and uh, I'm going to start. Um, let me just give a little bit of background. The, the tops of these um, pyramids are going to become literal pyramids pointing out of your structure. So if I want to be uh, red, pink, um, if I want to be, uh, yeah, red, pink, green going around uh, clockwise, then I'm going to go ahead and um, actually just kind of fit them over each other. Uh, I'm going to fit them over each other in that orientation um, to begin with. So uh, yeah, here we go. So I haven't actually linked anything. I'm just sort of fitting them together the way they're going to go. So you can see that three of these peaks are going to make a single pyramid in the final in the final construction. So they're going to be like that. I haven't linked anything yet, and I've got them red, pink, green uh, in that in that order from the uh, from the outside. So this is how I'm going to want to link them. I'll put the green one aside because I think it's a little harder to see since it's so dark, and I want to link the red and the pink this way. And so you can see that the red is going to come over the top of the pink in this order. And the easiest way to start is I want to slip this tab, which I think of as the as sort of like the belt buckle, into these two. And it just it just goes. Uh, Could you move your hands down? It's off screen. Oh, my apologies. Okay, should I go back to? Maybe I should. Um, let's see if I. Maybe I can. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, now you can see it all right. Let me go back to the arrangement that I had just to make sure that everybody can see that. This is, I was just lining them up to, for fit. This is how three are going to fit together uh, to combine. Do I need more light maybe? Uh, let me try a little extra light, see if that helps. Okay, I don't know if that does that make things more visible or less visible, or maybe not much difference. So anyhow, this is how they fit together. I'll take the green one out of the way uh, for the moment. So um, here are uh, the red piece over the pink piece, and um, I'm going to want to the 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 sort of uh, buckle um, of the pink on the inside here slips through these two slits on the red. So it comes from underneath. It slips through both of these slits. So it just briefly has just a little bit on the outside. So there's just a little bit of pink on the outside of the red, which I realize is probably invisible on camera. So let me do it with, let me, Temporarily do it with the green, so maybe that maybe that'll be more visible. I, I'll have to switch back to the pink to get the color scheme I want. But um, if I were putting the green here, like so, I would be separating out this buckle. It comes from behind. It comes out through the lower slit of the red. See now it's just peeking outside of the red just briefly, and it goes back in to the to the other end. So I have just now, hopefully you can see, I've got just a little bit of green showing between those two slits on the outside of the red. Uh, was, that, was that at all visible? OK. So I'll go back. And I actually wanted a pink there. I'm going to slide, I'm going to 
I have the red going over the pink. So from the inside, I get the, the uh, buckle of the pink, that interior tab, but sticking out. And then I slide it so it sticks back in through the second uh, slit. And that holds those together there. Then I move over to the main big tab here. And I just go ahead and I slide the point of the main big tab into the big diagonal slit there in the pink. And I slide it all the way in until hopefully I should get a bit of a click at the end. And now these two are, are pretty firmly attached to each other. And that's the goal that we are going for. And then to finish the vertex, and I recommend that you finish the vertex, uh, uh, you know, finish each vertex as you come to it, if you can. Um, I'm going to need to weave this into here. So the green is going to be over the pink, but it's going to be under the red. No, it's going to be over the red, but it's going to be under the pink. Sorry, my apologies. The green is going to come over the red because the big tab has to go inside there. And it's going to be under the pink. The, the, the big tab of the pink is going to come out of the outside of the green and slip in there. OK, so definitely you want to sort of preview it before you start uh, uh, you know, buckling anything in. And as with the other cases, you definitely want to uh, do this, in, this sort of interior buckle first. I'm going to bring the red uh, buckle out through the slit in the green. Here it is peeking out. And then I have to get it back into the uh, inside of the green. So it goes through both, just like a sort of like a belt buckle. And I won't do the big tabs yet. I'm going to uh, now do the buckle from the green into the pink. And it comes on out. And then uh, I'm going to get it to dive back in here. This last buckle can be a little tricky. You have to bend it around to uh, fit through both slits. And there we go. So I've got both buckles in now. And um, you know this holds together, but because of the stresses of the, the whole big polyhedron, we now want to take uh, our big diagonal tabs, uh, exterior tabs, and pop those into their respective slits in the pieces underneath. So that was pink into green. And here is. Uh, green into red. Like so. And that completes uh, a full uh, vertex of my uh, polyhedron looking like that. So every buckle uh, comes from behind, goes out through the lower slit, back in through the upper slit. And then on the other side of the ridge, I have the big outer tab going into uh, the slit. And that's how the vertices fit together. And now I'm just going to proceed around the um, entire polyhedron. Um, and in my color scheme, I'm going to now next focus on the red. I'm going to do all these red uh, vertices next. So I need to get some uh, of my red pieces uh, folded and, and uh, separated. So I'm going to do a couple of those. And then I'll, I'll do another vertex, give another chance to see the whole process in action. So the idea is that all the tabs that you're putting through with like the belt buckle and everything, those are underneath kind of the pyramid that you're forming between these three pieces, correct? The belt buckles start underneath, come out through the lower slit and go back in through the higher slit. Whereas right. the, the big, the, these diagonal tabs here, those are over the top and the diagonal tabs just disappear inside the uh, underneath piece. So I guess, or to, so to clarify, so I'm almost through kind of these pyramids. 
but these tabs are sticking kind of out on top. Right. So you want to reverse that that okay. one. So um, the the blue there should go on top of the uh, looks like orange. I think so. Yeah. The blue should be everywhere on top of the orange. Um, and the orange buckle will come out through the blue and go back in, and then the big blue tab will go into the uh, the orange slit from the outside, so, from the outside in. So you want to reverse the 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 you want the blue on top of the orange there instead of instead of underneath the orange. Gotcha. So then this tab will be pointing kind of will yeah, be, be going into hours. the interior gotcha. of the polyhedron, not coming out from inside. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Thank you for asking. So like you recommend, I imagine, to make a bunch of pyramids before you even start putting together your shape. Oh, no, no, no. I'm going to now start from this pyramid. I'm just going to start. This is this is my the, the seed of my polyhedron. I'm just going to start adding to this, and I'm going to work my way around the whole polyhedron. I don't oh, so recommend not... making a bunch of separate vertices and then trying to link those together, because what you'll end up doing is you may make too many independent vertices. And because each edge has to link two vertices, you may find that you can't actually link up your poly final polyhedron. It's much sort of safer to just always keep one big unit that you're working on and just work around your polyhedron. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this uh, single you know, one third vertex, and I'm going to add two more reds to make it a full red vertex. Oh, OK. So in other words, I, I don't recommend making subassemblies and trying to connect them because it's easy to lose track of where the subassemblies actually have to overlap. It's better to just make one polyhedron and just keep adding to it and work your way around the diagram. OK. Obviously, if we were making a single uh, 600 piece or, or more uh, you know, construction, then I would have pre-divided it into modules that, that we could build that wouldn't have this overlap problem. Um, but since you know, we're each making a separate piece and the pieces aren't so large, it's easier just to always keep your construction as a single uh, connected uh, component. Okay, so that's good. I'll fold this up. OK, so now I have the initial part that I've started working on. And I want all of them at this vertex to be uh, uh, red. Um, so uh, now I don't have to worry so much about the order. I can just really focus on how they fit together. Um, so I want to add two more reds to this. So I'll just start with one of them. I put it over the top. And that's the easiest way to think about it is the, as you go around, in this case, counterclockwise, each one's over the next. And uh, I will start by putting in the buckle. So the one that's underneath comes out through the lower slit of the pair, peeks out just briefly, and then heads back in. If you've ever, if you've ever tied a knot that's called a bolin, it's you know, there's the little mnemonic about the rabbit pops out of the hole, goes runs around the tree, and then pops back in. So it's sort of like that. It comes out of the slit, looks, peeks outside, and then pops back in. And then the big tab will just fit uh, through the big diagonal slit on the outside. And now I've got two out of three for this vertex. Uh, I'll, I'll rotate it a bit, put this one in place. Again, it's going to go over the top, except, of course, the uh, very starting one has to go over the top of that. That's how you get the weaving. And it's the, the weaving really helps strengthen 
the final vertex. So, you know, before I've done even any of the uh, tabs, it actually kind of holds in place. See, I can turn it upside down and it won't go anywhere. Even without having done the tabs, it kind of holds in place um, because of the, the weaving. So in other words, this one is over that one, uh, but this one is over that one, and this one is over that one. So they're each over the next one around in a circle. Uh, and it's that weaving that helps strengthen it. Now, of course, now that I have it in its spot, I do want to actually put the tabs in so it'll hold it together once I make the big polyhedron. So I'm going to come out uh, from here. I'm going to pop back in uh, through that tab, through the, the, the higher slit of the pair, and pull it through from the inside. And then I'm going to take the big tab and slip it in the big diagonal slit. Pull it all the way until it clicks. And uh, finally, I've got this one more. I got to find the buckle from the inside. I got to find the slit, stick it through. It's peeking out. And I want it to go back inside. The, the third buckle can be a bit tricky to get to get in, but there we go. I've got it in. And finally, the last big outside tab uh, into its slit until it clicks. And there we go. Now I have two adjacent vertices uh, of my polyhedron, like so. Now, just for ease, because the, those monochrome uh, vertices um, are uh, the easiest to uh, build. I don't have to worry about the color order. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and sort of do the whole red section of uh, my triacus tetrahedron. Um, and so um, holding it so that it matches my diagram uh, here, uh, I want on, on this here, I want to put two more reds. So I'll get those ready and then I'll add them on. And so at this point, this is the, the whole construction mechanism, um, except uh, for closing uh, a polygon. And so you have to just keep track of the number of polygons that have gone around in a ring um, and be ready to you know, do that uh, closure uh, when, when, when the time is ripe, so to speak. Um, so it's easy to like lose count and end up with a hexagon where you meant to have a pentagon or a heptagon, which is not going to be very good for us since we're trying to do positive curvature, um, where you meant to have a hexagon. Uh, so when I get to the first point where this closes up, uh, I will, I'll definitely highlight that. But so anyhow, just you can feel free to just start working your way around your polyhedron, um, and you know connecting up. You can do random colors. You can try to make a color scheme, uh, and um, if you close up to a pentagon every time it's possible, then you will very naturally just get a regular dodecahedron using thirty of the units. So that's sort of the briefest version of this. Now what we need is some music to build by. So if anybody has, you know, good tunes they want to put on. I've 
just opened up a bunch of um, breakout rooms. So if you, if there are smaller groups who want to go into those and chat as you make, um, you can do that without disturbing the group as a whole. Um, we will broadcast an announcement if there's anything that you need to be coming back to the main um, group to, to see. Um, but uh, yeah, if you want to go into smaller groups and talk to each other, uh, feel free to uh, pick a room and jump in. So here I am doing another red vertex up here. like I missed a, a slit. Glenn, could you just quickly show your diagram on the camera so that I can make a uh, screenshot? Oh yeah, absolutely. Let's see, uh, is that big enough there? Yeah. Uh, wait a second, sorry. Um, Yep, so I'll put that in the chat. Okay, sounds good. Okay, um, so for those of you who are here in this room, you can see I now have this mixed vertex, two red vertices, and uh, my next red is gonna close up a pentagon here. So once I uh, have a few more uh, pieces ready, uh, I'll end up doing both this vertex and then immediately doing that vertex afterward.
Okay, so um, I haven't actually put any of these junctions together over here, but uh, this is how it's gonna go to make my first closed loop, my first pentagon here. Um, and so when I put these together, I, uh, this will actually close into a pentagon here and uh, uh, we'll you know, start to actually get some curvature, some structure to this piece. You can see these pyramids don't quite line up because, well, they can't and stay planar. So uh, actually it's gonna, this is gonna start to force it to curve. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's worth uh, bringing people in, if there are people out in breakout rooms worth bringing them in for this or not. I'm making an announcement that they can come back if they wish. If they wish, yeah, okay, sounds good. And there's a question about mm -hmm. whether there's a, um, a a permanent record of uh, the instructions. Uh, uh, there will be soon posted on studioinfinity.org. I'll post this whole build. I just didn't want to post it ahead of time. Well, I think everyone is now back here. So okay, uh, very good. So uh, you can see this is the structure that I've built so far. I may, I'm, I'm focusing on the red section, but when I create this red vertex over here, and I'll just you know, do this, what I think of as previewing uh, to, to complete a red vertex here um, in that woven fashion, the, the weaving will get to be sort of second nature as you make more vertices. Um, you can see I actually am going to want these two to come together to close a pentagon. So they're actually going to tip like that. Now it feels a little uncomfortable, but that's because it's the pentagons that are responsible for creating the curvature here. So it should feel a little uncomfortable. And it turns out the third one at this vertex is going to be a pink, which is going to end up uh, weaving in just like this. So here's all the connections I'm going to make. Uh, now I'm going to go ahead and, and you know, connect them up that way, and you'll see that it'll start to, you know, want to curve. Uh, so I'm going to start with the red vertex. Um, so this is straightforward, just like uh, now done a whole bunch of times. Um, get the buckle through first. Okay, and the big tab. Okay, now I want to complete this red vertex. this over that. Oh, sorry, get this over that. There we go. Get that. Um, tab out here. There we go, here's the tab. And it's coming out and popping back in. Good, and the big tab. Okay, now I've completed that red vertex. And uh, one of the reasons I like this unit so much is that it the, makes the, the underlying graph of the vertices and edges of the polyhedron uh, you know, so clear. Here are the vertices and you can see the edge connections. 
And so looking at my diagram, I'm going to need to connect these. Those should be at the same vertex. So I'll go ahead and do that. Oops. Looks like I forgot to separate this tab. That's always a pain when you're in the middle of putting together and you have to pop your tab out. Okay, much better. So buckle. There we go, and the big tab. Okay, and uh, now I'll put in the third, I'll put in the third uh, piece at this vertex. Um, it's going to go like this in the end, and it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel like, do these really go together? Because again, we're creating uh, that curvature there. Um, we're creating that curvature there. And uh, so the stiff plastic is resisting that curvature, but we will uh, beat it into submission. Okay. And now I've got the green where I want it. I'll get this buckle. Like so. And like so. There we go. And one last big tab. And there we go. There's a uh, first pentagon, first closed loop. And you can feel that there's some tension on this. Uh, and ultimately, we're gonna, it's going to end up being forced to curve out like this once we have more of the structure. So now I'm just going to continue along. And as I you know, complete loops, uh, close them up like that. So that's really what I had at this moment. I'm just going to go back to uh, finishing off my red section. And then, uh, uh, then I'll probably do the pink section next because I've already got two of the uh, edges on it. All right, thanks. Hopefully, hopefully things are going well for you. If they're not, if you need any help or advice, just, uh, just holler on the chat. So I had a quick question related to um, kind of instructions and other documentation. Mm -hmm. um, suppose we wanted to run a similar activity for like a mass circle or something, um, yep. and we had access to you know, a similar sort of uh, sheet cutter. Mm -hmm. uh, would you be able to make some of kind of like the templates or other things available so that? Yes, absolutely. So uh, there's a PDF already for cutting out a paper. But if you want to run it on an actual cutting machine, uh, well, most of the consumer cutters, you want an SVG file. So um, I will, uh, right, after, uh, right after the event today, I'll post on Discord the uh, exact cut file that I use to make these. Um, and uh, then within a, well, let's say by next Wednesday, I'll have full instructions up on studioinfinity.org. Awesome, thanks. <laughs> no problem. And it's all Creative Commons license, so everybody should feel absolutely free to, um, you know, copy, disseminate, uh, riff on this uh, as you like. I should say, the, this is inspired by uh, an origami unit uh, that was created by a, a person by the name of Tom Hull. Um, obviously, this single sheet cutout is a bit different, but the original Fizz unit uh, was invented uh, by Tom Hull.
Glenn, someone in the chat asked how many colors total um, is being used if they want to follow along with you. I'm using five colors, one corresponding to each of the four faces of the original tetrahedron that the truncated triacus tetrahedron is based on, and uh, a, a fifth color, uh, which is for the edges of the original tetrahedron. What's re what remains of the edges of the original tetrahedron? And that's nine pieces of each of the uh, colors that correspond to the faces, and then six pieces because there's six edges of the of the fifth color. Okay, and for those of you that happen to be in this room, I've now completed the entire red section. So this is what's left of one face of the original tetrahedron. Here's a green edge leading to now the pink uh, face. So next I'm gonna focus on finishing this pink face.
Uh, I just have to step out briefly uh, to get stuff set up for cutting for my workshop tomorrow. Right. Um, so I'll be back.
Edmund, you want to just check a chat? Yeah. I just invited people back again. All right, are folks back or? Uh, 10 seconds before they're forced right. back. Oh, okay, very good. Oh, I like your shirt. Oh, yeah, it's um, sort of some designer's attempt at maybe being a little inspired by Penrose rhombuses. I don't know, but it is periodic. So as, as all textiles pretty much are. <laughs> Oh, I should probably switch back to, oh uh, yeah, I'll switch back to the main camera for me because I can just hold up what I'm doing. Everyone is back now. Okay, terrific. Well, I wanna thank you all for participating, of course. Um, and let's see where things stand. and. That way I can get a, a kind of a reading on the chaos meter. So uh, what I've got so far is I completed the red face and the pink face. And you can see two of the green edges and the start of the magenta face. So I'm over half done, uh, maybe not quite two thirds done. Um, so, uh, and of course, I, I, folk, I suppose various folks are at, at different stages uh, along the way. So I would rate this as a uh, reduction, but not elimination in chaos. Um, and I do thank you for participating. I will stay here uh, on, on this channel until I complete this. Uh, they, judging by the time it's passed so far, it might be another 45 minutes or so. You obviously have uh, lots of things on your agendas and so on, so do not feel at all obliged to stay if you want to stay. Uh, and I think at this point, it's a smaller group uh, can uh, you know, continue here in the main channel. We can even chat here in the main channel. Um, 
but uh, you know, if you need to do other things, if, if you want to complete this on your own time, I'd love to see photos of what you build in the, uh, on Discord. There's a, there's a channel uh, for this build. I will certainly post a picture of mine. Uh, and like I said, I will post uh, all the cut files and so on. Uh, so that if you want to do similar things, you can, and there'll be full uh, instructions, directions on uh, Studio Infinity next week. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed what you've done so far. Like I said, if you want to keep building, don't let me stop you, and I'll, I'll be continuing until I finish this. But thank you so much for participating, and I hope you're enjoying the week. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. This is terrific. Oh, good. I've got one more joint, one more. Oh, version. look at you. There you go with the dodecahedron. Oh, yes. The simplest one was the only one I can I give myself any confidence with. So. It, it is impressive. Megan as well. It is impressively difficult to screw up. Oh, uh, good. I, I'm really <laughs> impressed with, with the, the design. Like, oh, thank you. The only thing that I did wrong so far, or uh, actually I finished. So the only oh. thing I did wrong was I put um, four things together on one vertex and got a flat thing once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But nice. it is really impressively difficult to screw up. I, I, I really recommend this. The tabs and, and slots kind of, they align themselves is, is hopefully one of the advantages. They align themselves and there's kind of only one thing to do, which is the right thing. Great. Yeah, it feels really nat that. naturally, it very naturally sort of starts taking form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very yeah, short. like like the, the slots, like once you realize that the that thing is supposed to be a buckle and the other thing is supposed to be a slot, mm -hmm. everything only fits together in that one way. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciated that. Good. Awesome. I'm glad that part worked. I'll also mention that I uh, I didn't get the pieces, so I'm I used the origami folded pieces mm -hmm. that you linked to, but mine is very lopsided. Mm -hmm. So that's one big advantage of the pieces you made is even though I thought I was folding precisely to make the units, they they must be different because they're right. You know, my pentagons are kind of wonky. The well, they can come out wonky with this because of differences in how crisply they're folded. But that is one advantage of the CNC is the uniformity of the resulting pieces. Absolutely exactly. True. Yeah. But it didn't take me, it didn't take me too long. I'm not sure it's faster watching. Yeah, it's, I think uh, it's it just is, better. <laughs> it is um, the, the, the pulling them apart from the matrix uh, is unfortunately a little persnickety. Um, and it would be nice to find a way uh, in small quantities, you can have the machine cut all the way through. Uh, and so literally you just get the separated pieces, but in large quantities on a roll, you can't do that because the individual pieces can then get loose and jam up in the machine and, and throw the entire production off. So for a large quantity, you have to make them this way that they're like sort of, you know, pull apart as opposed to actually pre completely pre-cut. Yeah, I kind of thought that was the hardest part. Yeah, I also did my own origami pieces, and I think uh, what Catherine was saying is true. That there's like a propagation of error when you fold the pieces and they're just a little off, <laughs> and then yeah. the whole figure is off. <laughs> but yeah. it, it, I think it's kind of like the same speed if you do it with the CNC pieces, pieces and the, the paper pieces. Although the paper ones, I think there's more like uncertainty on where things should fit. So maybe that also complicates yeah. the process. <laughs> I, I did it, um, the, the thing where you print it um, and then cut it out. And then I just used a razor blade on a like a cutting surface to cut them all out. Mm. And it ended up almost completely symmetric. The only asymmetries are the paper I printed it on had varying thicknesses. So <laughs> some of them did not like to go in uh, certain slots because of that. but. Uh, other than that, like it, it was, it went very smoothly. Though it, like the amount of time it took to cut them all out uh, with the razor blade was um, excessive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, substantial. Yeah. But thank you for persevering. <laughs> it was worth it. It's really nice. I'm gonna stop the recording, Glenn. Yeah, yeah.